Hello and welcome back to another sunny day here at the lab. We're going to be doing some more transition metal chemistry. Very similar chemistry to previous video about, about, I don't know, time eludes me. Two months ago, I'm going to say. It's probably longer than that. Everything feels like it was two months ago. In that video, we made uh, a cobalt complex. It would have made sense for me to write it on the board, but, but I haven't. And it was a carbonato cobalt complex. So it had amine groups and then two of the ligand spots were taken up by a carbonate ligand, so a carbonato ligand. We can then take that complex and, and do some more interesting stuff with it later on. Anyway, I had a lot of fun with that video and we got some really nice colors, which I think a lot of people really enjoyed. So even though we're doing quite similar chemistry, there'll be different colors because we want to do the same reaction, but with different transition metals. So we're going to try it with nickel and copper if I have the right chemicals. So our first task of the day, as per usual, is finding whether we have the chemicals that I need <laughs> and enough of it because you got to do that first before you start the reaction as I've learned the hard way many times. We're following a procedure from a paper in, in the description and we need nickel nitrate first of all and I'm fairly sure I have nickel nitrate. I think it's in a salsa jar. That looks like it. Why is it in a salsa jar? And look at that. It is nickel nitrate. We must have made this for a video or something. Oh, I reckon, yeah, that was the perbromate project where we made pyrido nickel four. To start with, we've got some nickel nitrate. So I made this from nickel carbonate, nice Doritos container for it. I stopped doing the perbromate synth because I stopped believing it would actually work. I couldn't work out quite a way to isolate it and really reading that paper where they use pyrido nickel to um, oxidize bromate to perbromate. They don't uh, characterize the perbromate very well. They just look at the UV vis data and say it matches, but don't even show the UV vis data. Very easy to misinterpret UV vis data if that's what all you're basing your stuff on. They don't isolate the product at all. If they're making any at all, very, very trace amount. So uh, I'm not going to try that. I do have have another perbromate synthesis planned but it involves some pretty extreme reagents to put it lightly maybe we'll get to that this year but maybe not anyway we don't have copper nitrate but we do have copper sulfate shitty copper carbonate it's ancient and copper oxide so what we might do is we might just start from back from the copper oxide add the nitric acid to make a copper nitrate solution and, and then go on from there i think the amounts are pretty hand wavy anyway they just used rounded grams amounts like oh 10 grams here 20 grams of this they don't really work out exactly so so a little bit hand wavy which i like So I gave the copper oxide and nitric acid a little bit of heat and it's cleared up very, very nicely. Look at that lovely blue. So we've got our copper and we've got our nickel there. Next, we have to add our ammonia. So we've got our concentrated ammonia solution, our old enemy, which I'm just using a lot lately, but still complaining about. And we're using also ammonium bicarbonate, which is gonna introduce our carbonate ion while keeping the ammonium concentration really quite high. So we're gonna make a solution of uh, 20 mils or so of ammonia solution, and then uh, 20 grams of ammonium bicarbonate in that on top. So we're gonna be making up solution for both of these and then adding it, and we should see a very distinct color change as we go from the transition metal surrounded by six water molecules, the hexa-aqua nickel or hexa-aqua copper, to being surrounded by ammonia molecules, so amine ligands. In the case of the nickel, it'll be six amine ligands, so that's hexaamine nickel. And in the copper's case, it's actually gonna change a little bit more dramatically. So instead of having six groups around it, it's only gonna have four. So we're going to go to the tetraamine copper. We should see a very distinct color change on both of them, but especially the copper, as it changes its geometry from octahedral, which is the six, to the tetrahedral, which is the four. So when we first add our ammonia solution, we should see the nickel precipitating out as a hydroxide. That's because we're raising the pH above the point where the nickel ion is, is stable in solution. But as we increase it even further with more ammonia, what's going to happen is that nickel hydroxide is going to be recomplexed back and resolubilized. So in both cases, we should see some solid forming and then eventually that solid going back into solution and forming a, a solution with no precipitate in it at all.
right, we have our two beautiful solutions here. And I, and I hate to always say this, it feels really lame when I say this, but the colors don't come through on camera all that well. Purple especially, difficult for cameras, I think. It's so glowing purple. And on camera, it's gonna look blue. It's gonna look nearly the same color as this. It's nowhere near that. It's so vividly purple, kind of hurts your eyes to look at it. Okay, so next step, we need to oxidize our nickel two to nickel three, because we want the nickel three compound. We're gonna do that like we did with the cobalt, where we oxidize the cobalt two to cobalt three, just with our trusty peroxide of unknown concentration, but reasonable strength. So we just add, uh, I don't know, not much. We don't need all that much. The paper also seems to suggest that we need to add it to the copper one, because it just gives directions for the nickel, and then it says, oh, the cobalt and the copper and the zinc were all made in the the same way but I, I don't think we need it for the copper because we have copper two there and we're ending up with copper two I mean after this we just want to really concentrate the solutions on a hot water bath so I'll see if I can heat them both at the same time and really just uh, we want to concentrate it and remove a lot of the water to, to try and crystallize our complex out Why did I set this up inside? That was a rookie error. I should do this outside. I'm not gonna be spending much time in here. When the ammonia fumes start getting bad, that would be a very poor idea. What is needing to happen though, is we need to remove quite a bit of liquid and then we need to add um, ammonium bicarbonate just in little little portions just to keep the, both the ammonium and the carbonate concentration up as it boils because they're both gonna, gonna leave as gases, carbon dioxide and, and ammonia. So we need to replenish them. There's only gonna be five grams or so each. So we'll just add a, you know, a, a dash a pinch you know here and there every so often you probably think this setup looks a bit weird but that pump here is just pumping air in, in there and i find it helps evaporate things a lot faster if you've just got um, air being pumped in over the solution it's like having a little fan over the top but more effective because the air is kind of going in there and bringing hot water vapor out looks like the uh, copper has formed good crystals so far even though it's hot uh, the nickel still needs a bit of work. It looks like it's still got uh, quite a bit to go. So I'm going to um, take the copper off the heat. I don't want to risk decomposition. Just take it off the heat and then that'll allow all the heat uh, and the stirring to focus on the, on the nickel compound. All right, looks like the nickel is also crystallizing out. So we'll take that off the heat. Hopefully it's not all oxides from decomposition. We'll crank the heat down uh, and let that cool down crank it down, let it cool down, and the crystals will calm down. That's, um, that's what we want. Everything down. Actually, come to think of it, this might be a lot of nickel oxide, so it might be good to hot filter it. There's also five flies that somehow decided to kill themselves in a reaction vessel. Don't roast me about this. This rarely happens, but I can't stop all insects, okay? Um, that's it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, okay? But... Here we are. So I might quickly hot filter it and then let it cool down because at the moment I, I'm not entirely sure if we're confident about that being our product but if it definitely uh, crystallizes out after it's been hot filtered then, um, then we can definitely be sure it's what we think it is. All right, the copper is crystallized out quite nicely. Got quite a bit of crystals in there so it's been cooled down in this ice bath here. This nickel is, uh, there's nothing down there at the moment, but we haven't cooled it down yet. It's still quite warm, so I'm still holding out hope. Anyway, we've got to vacuum filter this. Now, usually I use my big vacuum pump, and that's just been the one vacuum that I've always used. But that's not treating it very nicely. There's quite a lot of times where I'm pulling stuff that are quite volatile. I'm filtering solutions from, say, acetone. It's not really a very good trap there, so a lot of the acetone will end up in the oil. So someone in the comments of my last video asked me if there's more cost-effective ways of vacuum filtration, because this was very expensive. I mean, it was $200, which was a bargain, but brand new would have been very expensive, and most like high-end vacuum pumps are very expensive, but it's just complete overkill for what you need for vacuum filtration. So here I have a little alternative. So this is just off eBay. It was 
like oh, 20, 30 bucks, which you know isn't dirt cheap, but it's affordable, I'd say. It doesn't come with the wiring, so I just hooked it up with some terrible charger with a connection that we would never use. This says five to 12 volts, depending on whether it gets 110 or 240 volts. And we're running 240 volts here in Australia. So I assume it's gonna give out 12 volts, which is good, which is what um, the voltage we want for the motor. Tell me otherwise if that's wrong. And then it just uses the same adapter as that pump does because it's a bloody international pump. Yeah, this pump runs some adapter. I don't know what country that is. Well, that fits perfectly. And then here, that's it. So we get just a very mild vacuum, nothing doing anything crazy, but you know, it's enough. You know what I mean? To pull some solutions through. And say we do some really corrosive substance, it gets sucked through or the vapors go through and the motor gets ruined. It's not a huge deal because it was only $30. Whereas if, if the motor gets ruined on this, this is pretty much irreplaceable for me. So it's nice to do all the harsh stuff through this small little thing. And, and it's nicer because I can let this run for quite a while, I assume. I haven't actually ran it for many hours, so I don't know whether the motor overheats and, and dies, but it's a lot nicer than hand pumps because say you want to just dry it on the pump it's hard to sort of hand vac it down you know whereas this keeps a constant airflow across it and and yeah and it's also quieter than this large pump is so maybe it's better for filming anyway we're just going to filter wash with a little ice cold water or actually ice cold ethanol and then um, really just dry thoroughly on the pump here Okay, maybe this motor isn't the, isn't the greatest. It's probably, maybe, I don't know, not getting supplied enough current and voltage or whatever, but it, it, it just pumps it down until it, it reaches a certain point and then seizes up. It just can't pump any more vacuum. I mean, the, the flask is under vacuum, pulling liquid through. Even though it's not running all the time, it's just pulling that vacuum and then it reaches its maximum and then that sort of thing. So if I, if I uh, mix this up a bit more and allow more air to get through, it's probably gonna stay on all the time right now because it's not reaching that high vacuum thing it's rattling around a lot yeah now see i've loosened it up a bit so it's just staying on constantly it's just constantly pulling air over that and seeing as we wash it with ethanol it should dry out very quickly which it looks like it's doing so this is what we mean by dry on the pump so it's having air pulled over it constantly which will dry it out so uh, vacuum pump is working okay for what we need it for yeah our nickel solution looks like there's finally some crystals. I gave it a little bit more time to evaporate. It still looks very um, sludgy, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but there does look like there are starting to be some crystals uh, coming through in there. All right, this really just looks like nickel hydroxide. Once again, this is not what we want. This color down the bottom of our nickel complex really looks promising i think uh it's not any copper contamination from the glassware i did really wash it out that blue color is coming from the nickel so once we filter out this green suspension of hydroxide we do have some promising signs of our complex but it's just getting it out because it seems like when i'm heating the solution to evaporate it down it's decomposing to the to the oxide or the hydroxide so I might try and just put it in a really tiny beaker and really gently heat it to to get some water off just to see if we can get some actual blue crystals out Here's our crystals of the copper complex. There's far too many grams of this. It's like 150% yield or something, 120%. I haven't exactly calculated it, but there's too many for me to be uh, non-suspicious about it. I think it's a little wet still, but also I think it's got ammonium bicarbonate crystals through it as well. While it looks very purple, you can see there's kind of flecks of white in it too. That ammonium bicarbonate is uh, kind of crystallize out with it. I'm just going to suspend it in a little bit of cold water. It should dissolve the ammonium bicarbonate. Yeah, you can see that colors all through and then really thoroughly you know wash it with cold water and wash it with ethanol to try and remove all this ammonia bicarbonate impurity in it Concentrated it, made it ice cold, but it really doesn't look like it's going to crystallize anything out. Looks like it's close, but I don't know. Maybe there's just not enough nickel in there. Maybe it all just decomposed and all ended up in hydroxide. There's just too much nickel there. 
Oh, and I tried my tactic of letting this sit here for a week, seeing if anything crystallizes out, and potentially, potentially, although the previous two times I have been disappointed and it has been hydroxide, but, I mean, it looks blue. It could just be because the blue solution has soaked into it, but there's a chance a nickel could have crystallized out here. My God, it's goddamn nickel hydroxide again! It fooled me for the third time. That's... Oh, fucking gets my hopes up every time and then I finally wash it and it reveals that green shitty color. It's fucked. Chemistry is a fucking cruel mistress sometimes. Ah, <sighs> all right. Well, we're giving up on our dreams of a nickel complex in this video. How are we doing on the copper front? Here we have a very nice, good final product. It's dry. It looks very good. It's only two grams. So we had 14 or so grams of wet product before, and now we've gone down to two grams. Now a very low yield, as per usual. What I did is I noticed there was some copper hydroxide in the product, so I kind of physically separated it because these are quite large crystals. They are separated from the paste of copper hydroxide oxide very easily. I don't need very much of this material because we're actually making an energetic from this and so I don't need you know 10 grams. Two grams is, is enough and I'd rather have nice high quality material now have this stuff contaminated with uh, uh, copper hydroxide. Now finally we need to do some uh, testing. There is a compound that's just tetraamine copper 2 nitrates. Purple compound so it would look the same. So how do we know we've got a carbonato ligand attached to our complex? Well we have some hydrochloric acid here and if we add a few crystals of this what we're looking for is a few bubbles of carbon dioxide because the tetraamine complex won't form any gas with hydrochloric acid but with the carbonato ligand on there it will form some gas. So if we see some bubbles, we know we've at least got some of the compound it has the carbonator attached to it as well. It's not just four amine groups.